Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Looks like, uh, I think everything's working. Hi, everyone. Uh, we were gonna play a video game today. I was very excited. Uh, for those who don't know, um, Otori Giso, which is a, a classic Japanese novel, visual, not interact, sound novel, that's the term, uh, has been officially fan translated. Offic that's a weird way to, it's been fan translated for the first time, which is huge. And it's a game I've mentioned a lot in my research because it influenced Fatal Frame, it influenced Silent Hill. I'm really excited to play it and we will stream it this week. But I couldn't make it work today. I don't know what I did wrong. So I couldn't make it work. I was like, okay, we'll do a book reading. And someone in Discord requested we continue this book. So we shall. Uh, but since I'm sure lots of folks weren't here because this was a little while ago, I will catch us up. It's, we're barely in the book. Hello, everyone. This is Golden Terrace. It is a Chinese novel that has been translated by uh, a, an indie publisher called Peach Flower House. It's quite good. It's a historical drama. It's politics. It's, you know, the emperor's court. Um, two characters who are very different are forced into a marriage against their will, and they have to survive together and, you know, come across all these political conspiracies, and there's drama, and there's, you know, war, and it, it's quite good. Uh, our two main characters are... Let's see if I can flip back to the very beginning here. Fu Shen, who was a military general and uh, was injured in battle. He was the, the, the staunch defender of China's borders from the Mongolians who they are at war with at this point. The, the book calls them something else. It's a different, different group because of the time period, but it's that area, Mongolia. And um, he is badly injured. He is now disabled. His legs uh, are, are badly injured, so he, he's in a wheelchair and um, has been brought home. And the emperor basically is afraid of him because he's very popular, he's very powerful there. So he forces him into a marriage with the emperor's right hand, Yan Shaohan, who is uh, basically the head of the, the secret police, sort of. Um, he is very, uh, not necessarily power hungry, but ambitious. He rose from nothing to you know make his own way and now the emperor really trusts him and has basically married him to this guy to keep an eye on him. But they kind of have a complicated relationship where it's sort of a love-hate thing where they respect each other, but they always disagree on everything, have a lot of differences. So it's a very fascinating story. We are only three chapters in. The first three uh, that I read last time, I will download and move to the book channel along with this uh, tonight. So if you want to go back and listen to that part, you can also do that. You can also excuse me, buy the full series from Peach House. It's just two books, so it's like, I think, 40 bucks, or they have ebook, which is much cheaper. So I think last time, yes, the it's two guys getting forced married, because this is ancient China and noble men could marry each other. Um, you couldn't if you were poor, <laughs> but if you were a noble, you could basically marry whoever you wanted, you know. So yes, uh, Fu Shen, the military general that's now disabled, and Yan Shaohan, the... Uh, the police leader guy is, uh, they are both men. Did you think, Jeff, did you truly, truly think I would read anything that wasn't? If it's not horror, it's gay. If it's not gay, it's horror. It's one or the other. Chapter four, Golden Terrace. The Duke of Ying Manor. The autumn day was cool, but inside it was warm and cozy. The long couch was by the window. On a small table, all types of pastries and fresh fruit were laid. A half-grown boy with one leg crossed over the other had his head down, pretending to read the volume in his hands. He hadn't turned a page in ages. The level below was full of standing maids who occasionally exchanged looks or pouted or made veiled hand signals, their faces expressive. They were at no point well-behaved. The teenage boy had just been stirred to action by these coquettish glances when a young maid suddenly ran in from the outside and crisply said, "'Madam is coming.' Everyone's expressions turned grave. All the maids obediently stood still. The teenager's legs stopped twitching, and his bones were no longer soft. Holding the book in both hands, he swiftly t twisted into an appearance of propriety. By the time the splendidly dressed lady came in, what she saw was a classic portrait of a student hard at studies. Madame Chin, leaning on the arm of a maid, sat down on the couch. The teenager stood up to salute her and warmly called out mother, then sat next to her. Madame Chin took his hand and said with displeasure, It's dark. Why haven't the lamps been lit? Take care not to damage your eyes. 
Hearing this, the maids immediately lit the lanterns and brought fresh tea. The teenager carelessly fabricated. I was so focused on reading I didn't notice it. Mother, what brings you here? Madam Chin said, I went to the forecourt to see your third uncle and discuss some things, and on the way back I was passing by, so I came to look at you. It will save a trip for me this evening. The teenager's eyes turned. Is it concerning my big brother? Madam Chin looked askance at him. Clever, aren't you? You never focus on your studies. All you do is pick up gossip. It's all over the capital. Is there any need for me to go deliberately picking it up? The teenager sneered. He got his legs broken and couldn't stick it out at the border, so he's had to come back to the capital to retire, right? Hearing this, Madame Chin pur pursed her lips and pressed his hand heavily, but she didn't reproach him, only instructed the servants attending on them. Withdraw, all of you. I need to talk to Yair alone. The servants all bowed and left the room. Two upper maids remained in the corridor, while the rest went into the courtyard to amuse themselves. All the maids who looked after the young master were pampered, pretty, and pleasant. Quite a few among them were naive, simple-minded women with chivalry in their hearts. Two who were on good terms got together to whisper to each other. When they came to what they had heard in the young master's room, one of them indignantly said, it's no wonder the first gentleman wants to live outside. If he was at home, who knows what state that lady would torment him into. So, catch up with all what that all means. Um, th this is the family of Fu Shen, the military general. His uh, mother-in-law, I think it's clarified later, who uh, they don't like him. And the teenager is his younger half-brother who's just said, oh, that's, you know, he's been injured and he's coming home to retire. Mom's up to something and if you know anything about how chinese politics chinese family inheritance works her son will not inherit the titles the money the anything to do with this household if mr military man comes home and claims it she wants him out of the way so she's going to have to figure out a way to get rid of him now at this i, I already told you about the marriage plot because it's on the back of the book but this is how the marriage plot's going to come about the other one said with a smile not necessarily. You wouldn't know it. When he was at home, whenever our madam and the young master saw him, they were like mice who had been seen a cat. He looks like a promising young man, all orchids and jade trees, but his temper is like a tempest. Now that's a real man who can hold up heaven and earth. The first gentleman is a young hero, but he can't even be mentioned in his own home. Our young master has no conscience. He distances himself from his own big brother, only listens to the insinuations of those malicious little people. The other maid lightly smacked her on the back of the hand. What do you know? They don't have the same mother. How can he count as his own big brother? Reasonably speaking, only the second young mistress, that's Princess Chi now, can call him her big brother. As for our young master and the crown prince's first consort, in his heart, there are 3,000 li behind his cousins. Uh, li is a measurement, so it's like they're miles away from each other. And they're going to explain a little more of the politics here. The late Duke of Ying, Fu Qingzhong's first wife, had died young, leaving behind one son, Fu Shen, and one daughter, Fu Ling. At 17, Fu Ling had married the emperor's son, Prince Qi, becoming his first wife. The duke's second wife, Madame Qin, had two daughters and one son. Her eldest daughter, Fu Ting, had gone into the palace and been selected as the crown prince's consort. Her young son, Fu Ya, and her younger daughter, Fu Shi, still of tender years, were both at home being raised by their mother. Okay, I should have thought of doing, like, guides things. Okay, so our main character, Fu Shen, has a sister. Sister married a prince, but not the main prince, like not the guy that's going to inherit the crown, uh, supposedly. I mean, it could happen, but it doesn't say he's the crown prince. He's just the emperor's son. But the stepmother's daughter married the crown prince, so presumably she might become empress. So they're kind of implying, you know, the family has different powerful connections here. When Madame Chin had married in, Fu Shen had already been old enough to understand things. He hadn't been close to her. After Fu Ya was born, the two of them had become even more estranged. They were limited by their positions. It was hard to avoid a conflict between a stepmother and the eldest son of the first wife. After all, with Fu Shen ahead of him, the title wouldn't go to Fu Ya in the future. But before Madame Chin could carry out any little tricks, Fu Tinshong had been assassinated at the northern frontier. At the time, in order to win over officials of outstanding merit, Emperor Yontai had been treating military officials quite preferentially. 
So he had decided not to pass the rank to the next generation, making a decree to an exception to decree that Fu Tenshin would inherit the title of Duke of Ying. Later, Fu Tenshin passed away. The military situation at the border was critical, and Fu Shen rushed out into the battlefield before the mourning period had passed. The title of Duke of Ying had remained vacant. The Ministry of Rights, in accordance with Emperor Guan Tai's hints, had let the third master, Fu Ting Yi, inherit the position. When Fu Shen returned to court after winning merit, he had instead been made Marquis of Jin Ning. Okay, more politics. Um, his uncle got the title. He got passed over it for his uncle and was given a different title instead, which basically means that the power stayed with his family line, but it wasn't given to him. It kind of, they kind of slighted him a little bit because he was out on the battlefield. And uh, when he got, came home, they gave him a different title to be like, okay, cool, you know, now you both got titles, so it's equal. But the, the, the lady's going to use that, uh, the, uh, that as an excuse to get rid of him. Uh, not sure what's going on, but your Silent Hill documentaries were dope. Well, thank you. Uh, we do book readings sometimes. It's been a while because I've been so sick, but we're going to get back to streaming in general, I would hope. Uh, I am working on some videos, but Silent Hill is probably not going to happen until next month. I mean, it's already the end. Of yeah, it'll be April <laughs> before I get that one out. Using this as a pretext, Madam Chen, citing the fact there were now two titles in the family and a tall tree catches the wind, had made the suggestion Fu Shen should live apart. Fu Shen knew what she was planning. She was simply after the position and wanted to elbow him out. Madam Chen was short-sighted, but the new Duke of Ying, Fu Ting Yi, thought further ahead. The Fu family's true asset wasn't the title of Duke, but the Beiyan Cavalry. But three generations of the Fu family had a close connection to the Beiyan army. If this went on, the Beiyan army would sooner or later change its name to the Fu family corps. What would the people of the empire think of that? And what would the one sitting on the throne think of it? So Beiyan uh, cavalry or Beiyan army is the, the army that Fu Shen leads to defend the border. And they're saying, you know, it might be a good idea if you, the army leader, distance yourself from the family to keep them from ever accusing the family of consolidating power. So it was better to fall back in order to advance. In the future, Fu Shen would inevitably hold the Beiyan cavalry firmly in his hand, while the Duke of Ying Manor, or rather the Colossus of the Fu family, could no longer be tied to the Beiyan army. After weighing up the relative merits, the present situation had come about. The Beiyan army commander, the Marquis of Jin Ning, Fu Shen, had set up housekeeping on his own and had practically no contact with the Duke of Ying Manor. The Fu family's third master, Fu Ting Yi, had inherited the title and was acting the idle noble. While Madame Chin lived at the ducal manor with her children, only waiting for Fu Ya to come of age to request he be made heir to the title. Neither mother nor son had any fond feeling toward Fu Shen. For Madame Chin, it was because of her guilty conscience. She couldn't stand to see him succeed, lest he turn around and bite back at her. Fu Ya probably thought that since Fu Shen hadn't offered up the position of heir to him with both hands on his knees, that meant he naturally owed him. Inside the principal room, Madame Chin put on a stern expression and chided, That mouth of yours. It's one thing to talk at home, but when you're outside, you must on no account carelessly wag your tongue. Mother, Fu Ya tossed a fruit into his mouth. Drawling, he said discontentedly, He's already left the Fu family. Why should I be afraid of him? What do you know? You're talking drivel anyway, Madame Chin lightly slapped his leg. His parents' memorial tablets are both here. He's only living apart. How can he not be a member of the Fu family anymore? After all, he is your older brother, and he has occupied a high position from a young age. While his temper has been somewhat restrained in recent years, in earlier years he was an unforgiving fiend. Be cautious. Don't fall prey to him. Fu Ya snorted indifferently. Madame Chin said, in a few years, we'll be asking for you to be made the heir. Your third uncle favors Fu Shen. He's just waiting for you to slip up. You must not put a step out of place now. Have you got that? She lowered her voice. Put up for with it for now, my son, and one day the title of Duke and all the family property will be yours. No one will be able to fight you for it, not even Fu Shen. He will only be able to stand by and watch. Madame Chin's voice was almost low enough to be a whisper. Fu Ya's heart jumped. He raised his head. Mother? Mother has a way. Madame Chin tightly squeezed his hand. Set your mind at ease. 
how many stories involved spoiled children being ruined by their mothers and scheming too much, causing all the problems? Hey, Mars. Hello, folks joining us. We are reading a Chinese historical political novel, part one of which uh, is not yet on the book chat. I'll put it up tonight. The Eastern Palace. The crown princess Lady Sen faced a bronze mirror as she removed her hairpins and earrings. The attending maid, combing her hair, bent down and quietly said into her ear, My lady, the Duke of Ying Manners, Madame Chin, sent a servant today to pay, first, pay respects to first concert Fu. Consort Fu. Concert. She's playing music. <laughs> they sat together in her hall and talked for a long time. The crown princess's hand paused. She thought briefly, then understood. Smiling, she said, as she likes, I've heard that the Marquis of Jin Ning has returned to the capital. Madame Chin must be feeling rather uncomfortable, so she's in a hurry to ingratiate herself with our prince. The maid was a close confidant who had accompanied her as part of her dowry. Hearing this, she said uncomprehendingly, But isn't the Marquis of Jin Ning? He's crippled, but he has yet to fall, Lady Sen said. The Marquis of Jin Ning is famous among the people, and his prestige at court is extremely high. He also holds the military authority of the northern frontier. Even if he hands it over, the Bayan army will be full of his former direct subordinates. He will still be able to summon hundreds with one cry. To be disrespectful, never mind Madame Chin, even our prince must give way to him somewhat. The crown princess Lady Sen's father was the military commissioner of Jinchu, Sen Hongfang. There was some friendship between him and the Duke of Ying Manor. Lady Sen had been picking up subtle influences from him since she was little. Her ability to read a situation was no less than a man's. Had Fu Shen not gone to the northern frontier, perhaps he would have been among the candidates to become Sen Hongfang's son-in-law. Dismissing the topic of temperament, the Marquis of Jin Ning's conduct was extremely upright, and he was young and a war hero, covered in military honors, enchanting to countless young mistresses waiting to be betrothed. I remember that First Consort Fu had a little brother, said Lady Sen. They were going to request that he be made the Duke of Ying's heir in a couple of years. Yes, my lady. Our prince originally had his eye on the Marquis of Jin Ning's full-blooded young sister, the current Princess Qi, and sent someone to consult the Fu family's views in private. At the time, Second Master Fu was still the head of the household at the Duke of Ying Manor. Because this was his eldest niece, he couldn't very well make an arbitrary decision himself. He went to ask the Marquis of Jin Ning about it. Slowly, she recalled the rumors in the capital at the time. She stroked her temples. All of a sudden, a faint, entirely causeless grief welled up in her heart. The Marquis of Jin Ning was about the same age First Concert Fu's little brother is now. When he heard that his sister was unwilling, he refused the marriage without another word. They're all that resolute in the Fu family. Even if it meant offending his highness, he still wanted to find his sister a marriage to her satisfaction. We all stand a, a high, high moral man. <laughs> Princess Chi Fu Ling had such a good big brother. It really did make a person envious. For the sake of the position of hair, Madame Chin abandoned all face. She sent her daughter into the palace and split up her family and made an unsightly ruckus. And what came of it? The Marquis of Jin Ning's sister is the grand glorious Princess Chi, while Madame Chin has to rely on First Consort Fu when she needs anything, and rack her brains to keep clear of me like a thief. Sneering, Lady Sen continued, If her son had half the Marquis of Jin Ning's willingness to take on responsibility, First Consort Fu would never have ended up submitting to humiliation at my hands, cowering and fawning. The maid knew that the words Marquis of Jin Ning had touched a remote regret in the crown princess and felt that the crown princess was unusually acerbic tonight. She gave a firm assent. Well, my lady, should we distance her from his highness for the next few days? Lady Sen looked into the bronze mirror briefly, muttering to herself. A m long moment later, she waved a hand and said, No need. None of them are worth their salt anyway. Even if his highness shows them favor, it will all go to waste. Night. Inside the Eastern Palace's Chunfang Pavilion. The Crown Prince Sun Yun, Yunliang was for once staying the night. First Consort Fu came forward to help him remove his outer robe and attend on the Crown Prince as he cleaned himself up. Though she was as solicitous as usual, there was a persistent gloom between her brows. To Sun Yunliang's eyes, the sorrowing beauty with her shapely brows slightly knit had a particular romantic air to her. He couldn't resist coming over to embrace her and provide his attentions. When the clouds had cleared and the rain had ceased, he languorously asked, What is it? 
What troublesome matter has you so worried? Fu Ting quickly stood and knelt by the bed to ask forgiveness. Today my mother sent a servant to tell me about a certain matter. I was scared out of my wits. Because of this I have been a little distracted. I beg your highness's forgiveness. The crown prince pulled her back into his arms. I pardon you. What was this matter? Tell me about it. Fu Ting's brow instantly cleared. It was as if she had beheld a savior. Her eyes were full of reverence and trust, making the crown prince feel even more complacent. She drew close to the crown prince's ear, her breath delicate as an orchid scent. I won't conceal it from you, your highness. This matter concerns my older brother, the Marquis of Jin Ning, Fu Shen. So if you follow all that, it opened with the Marquis's uh, family, his stepmother and half-brother, kind of scheming about how they want him to inherit the family's title and money instead of the older brother. And the mother saying, don't worry about it, I got it. Then we switch to the crown princess talking about how uh, the, the two female members of that family, one got married for love to a prince and the other was married for politics as a consort instead of a wife. So basically part of a harem. And uh, it was all to make sure that the, the mom had an ear in the palace, somebody to, you know, help maneuver things. And then we see the scene where said daughter is maneuvering things with the prince, you know, a, a lucky night they got together. And the mom is putting some kind of idea in the prince's head that she has had the daughter pass on. So now we are in chapter five. This year, it seemed, was destined to be turbulent. Near the end of the year, following the major case of the attack on the Eastern Tartar diplomatic mission that had shaken the court and the commons, yet another rumor concerning the Bayan commander spread among the high officials and nobles in the city like a single flame growing into a prairie fire. The Marquis of Jinning Fushen had the Long Yang proclivity. He had peach parting, cut sleeve tendencies. So those are all fun fun <laughs> fun terms for homosexual um cut sleeve comes from a story about an emperor who cut his the sleeve of his his shirt off so he wouldn't wake his male lover so cut sleeve became a term for homosexual people uh peach parting that's butt peach is a synonym for butt for in china for quite a long time Long Yang is a place that, like, most cultures have a place that they say, oh, well, that's where all the gay people are from. <laughs> like, um, I don't see in the notes why it says Long Yang, if that was, like, a place where our, I don't know, but that, I think that's a place. Um, in, in like, Middle, m Middle Ages Europe, it was Italy. <laughs> it was called the Italy or the Italian disease or something like that. This always, this, uh, the, uh, lesbianism was called, like, the Egyptian problem in ancient Christian writing. Like, it's just a thing. It just happens. So, they're saying the rumors are now spreading that he is gay. The emergence of this news was odd, but thinking about it carefully, there was much in it to be considered. Moreover, people were never afraid of using the most obscene conjectures to supplement the truth. It wasn't long before vivid accounts of Fushen's love affairs since he'd joined the army spread widely through the homes of the nobles and admirable subjects, even becoming a topic of idle chat at some people's tea and dinner tables. In Great Zhou, preferring men wasn't especially far out of bounds, and the people of the times were unusually tolerant of it. But for such a thing to manifest in a general holding military authority it was no longer as simple as a mere hobby. This is pretty historically accurate. Like, this is a fake time period. The, the name of this era isn't identical to any era in China's history. But there are, like, periods of Chinese history where the popularity or the acceptance of male homosexuality came and went, like... Um, nobles, like I said, for a good deal of Chinese history could marry men. I think at some point it got restricted more. Um, women, it kind of just didn't pay attention. Like, it's so much of history. Like, what women were doing was just ignored or not written down. But you know how it is. The previous dynasty's dynastic name had been Yu. It had reigned for over a century, producing during that time a romantic emperor who had gone down in history. His posthumous title was Suzong. Before ascending the throne, Suzong had favored a beautiful woman with the surname Han. After ascending the throne, he had not only made Lady Han his imperial consort, he had also ennobled her father and all her brothers. Imperial consort Han's little brother was named Han Song. 
History recorded that he had been be pretty and graceful, with a face like a beautiful woman's, with a character like bright pearls and fine jade. Because of his big sister, Hansan joined the Luan Yi Guard. Once, while escorting the emperor's carriage during an outing, he appeared before the emperor. Su Song fell in love with him at first sight. After returning to the palace, he could not forget him. In despite of social conventions and traditions, he brought Hansang into the palace. Forget merely granting him imperial favor, he created a special title outside the ranks of the consorts and concubines, Imperial Companion, equal in consequence to the Imperial Consort, making the sister and brother both attend on the same man. Ah, nobles. Ah, emperors. <sighs> The Great Yu Dynasty had no precedent for any such thing. From the court to the common people, no one was unshaken. The civil and military officials strenuously admonished him to no end, only wishing to line up to strike their heads to death on the floor before the Imperial Hall. While Su Song was a romantic, leaving aside that identifier, first and foremost he was an emperor, the head of a nation. He could not permit himself to become the target of a crowd of officious fatheads ridicule over a small personal matter. In his anger, this rather crafty official emperor uh, issued a decree permitting high-ranking scholars, of scholar officials to take male concubines, while officials of the sixth rank and above, as well as nobles and imperial kinsmen, could marry male wives, equal to first wives. I don't know if that part's historically accurate. I'm not sure. If it wasn't, they, I'm sure they added it because the, main, the, the, the whole premise of the book is she wants to write a male marriage, but uh, I don't know. It might. I don't know. When a superior develops a hobby, his subordinates must be develop a passion. Once this exception had been made, while those waiting to see what would happen made up a majority of the court, many scholars extolled being a cut sleeve as a matter of refinement. So the common people followed suit in droves. From then on, relationships between men flourished unceasingly. Su Song reigned for nearly 30 years, and none of the ministers dared to present a memorial to the throne requesting this decree be rescinded. It was only when the previous dynasty was in an increasingly rapid decline that the then reigning Sh Xuan Song, feeling that the preval prevalence of relationships between man ran counter to the heavenly principles and tradition resulting in a stagnating population, a sharp drop in the number of strong workers, difficulty in sowing and reaping, at last issued a decree prohibiting ma marriages between common men. An imperial order sent male concubines back to their homes, returned their indentures to them, and re-enrolled them in the house register. But there were still exceptions to the decree. Shun Song not only permitted men who had the status of first wife to remain in their husband's family, he deliberately issued a benevolent decree. All officials of the sixth rank or above, dukes and marquises and imperial kinsmen, if they were willing to marry a man as their first wife, were permitted to submit a memorial to the throne for a special dispensation granting their marriage. Of course. Hello, caffeine. I'm glad you're enjoying it. This benevolent decree became Xuan Song's secret weapon to check powerful ministers and his own family members. For nobles inheriting a title especially, taking a man to wife meant having no direct descendants. If there was no one to inherit the title at their death, it would revert to the court. Following the end of the Yu Dynasty, owing it to the outstanding efficiency of this bloodless killing blade, it had continued to be used to this day. And since Great Zhou had been established, about a dozen courtiers had had marriages granted to them by the emperor, all people with great authority and vast influence. Basically, what he's saying is it gave the emperor the power to uh, approve male marriages, but due to the system of inheritance in China, you have to have an eldest son of your bloodline. Well, I guess there, there are cases of adoption, I'm pretty sure. But basically, your bloodline would end because you would not have a wife. Your, your wife would not be your first partner. And whatever, like, titles and, and things you had would revert back to the imperial court when you were dead. So it gave the court more power. The Beiyan's army commander, the Marquis of Jinning, the eldest son of the Duke of Ying by his formal wife, under any guise, what he would fear most was being smeared with the word cut sleeve. So many people had their gazes fixed menacingly on him, and the emperor was fretting about having no excuse to take over the military power he held. Why at this precise moment would this rumor spread? Fu Shen was living quietly at home, paying no visits to family or old friends. Naturally, he had no way of knowing about these rumors. 
His subordinates, meanwhile, due to having heard too much unreliable gossip about the Marquis of Jinning, from extravagant embellishments to monstrous tales, had long to long ago learned to take rumors in stride. Had they any political acuteness, none of them would have allowed the rumors to spread rampantly like this. The plotters were sharpening their knives, while the one at the center of the plot had his eyes and ears closed, utterly ignorant. Now we're going to get back to the other guy, our other main character that works for the Emperor, Yan Shaohan. By the time Yan Shaohan, who was slightly more alert, heard this rumor from the mouth of a Feilong guard, his heart instantly jumped. His intuition told him this was going to be bad. That night, he received no answer from Fu Shen. Under the circumstances, the most resolute of people couldn't help wavering. Yan Shaohan had the upper hand, but sadly he wasn't at all pleased. Emperor Yuan Tai hadn't permitted the Feilong Guard to take over the case of the attack on the Eastern Tartar diplomatic mission. All Yan Shaohan could do was choose to investigate in private. The doubts in his heart hadn't disappeared. Though Fu Shen had said it was Yan Shaohan having too high an opinion of him, a person who could leave a battlefield in one piece falling into an ambush like this was like a duck inexplicably drowning to death in a bucket of water. Never mind that this ambush was full of peculiar peculiar peculiarities even with the Phalong guards methods he had to this day been unable to discover the mastermind he's talking about the attack that led to uh fu shen being disabled the, he got very badly injured um yan shaohan thinks it's suspicious but the emperor won't let him investigate it which makes him more suspicious that something happened in the background that this was maybe planned by someone within the court Fu Shen's attitude had made him suspect that there was perhaps some secret behind this case, and Yan Shaohan needed the truth behind it. It had nothing to do with fairness, and it wasn't for the sake of morality. It was because he wielded a monstrous knife of unparalleled sharpness on behalf of the Emperor. He wanted to get a clear look at the turbulent currents hidden beneath the surface, so he could control where the blade struck rather than have it backlash against him or be sucked in by the hidden current. Past emperors of the present dynasty had attached great importance to the Imperial Guard. Within the Imperial City were the left and right Jinwu, Luan Yi, Jiu Men, Shao Qi, and Bao Tao Guards, ten in all known as the Ten South Yaman Guards. Within the palace were the left and right Yu Lin, Shen Shu, and Shen Wu Corps, six in all dedicated bodyguards known as the Six North Yaman Corps. Outside of these, the Feilong Guard supervised the officials and patrolled the borders. Its commanding officer was an upper third-rank imperial investigator, withstanding to present memorials in secret to his, in His Majesty's presence. I should explain, memorials are like laws or like, like when somebody in the government writes a bunch of shit and present, like, here, President, sign this, so it becomes law. Like, a memorial is kind of like that. So he's allowed to present memorials in secret, which means people don't know it's him or what's on it. Like, he can do it in secret. He is basically secret police. The commander of each corps of the North Yaman was part of the Feilong Guard, and Yan Shaohan held the position of Imperial Investigator above all the commanders. In terms of real authority, he was the leader of the North Yaman Imperial Guard. The one who had brought the rumor that the Marquis of Jin Ning is a cut sleeve into the Imperial Guard was the commander of the left Shen Shu Corps, Wei Shuzhou. Shuzhou. The Wei family was numerous, with many marriage alliances. They could find relations among the greater part of the nobles in the capital. General Wei was even more richly endowed by nature. There wasn't another man in the Imperial Guard to rival him in enthusiasm for acting as matchmaker or passing along gossip. It was well known among the Feilong Guard, as well as uh, that Yan Shaohan and Fu Shen didn't get along. Taking pleasure in another's misfortune, Wei Shuzhou said, This rumor is too nauseating. Look at how lofty and virtuous the Marquis of Jin Ning is normally. Here I was thinking he would only have his own hand for company for the rest of his life. <laughs> Yan Shaohan's brow furrowed deeply. Where did you hear that? General Wei said, My second uncle's wife's younger sister's husband's cousin. The Marquis of Liu Yan's wife, that is. He has an unwed daughter and took a fancy to the Marquis of Jin Ning, so he asked around in private. That's when he heard that there was such a secret. Yan Shaohan put a hand to his forehead. He had no desire to speak to him. Your Honor, Wei Shuzhou said curiously, circling him twice, it's the Marquis of Jin Ning who has such a hobby, and he isn't fretting, so why are you fretting on his behalf? Fishy, 
too fishy. A man who hadn't had an unlucky turn in several years was suddenly so unfortunate that he could get something stuck in his teeth while drinking cold water. What had Fu Shen done to enrage man in heaven that demons of all descriptions were bringing out their numerous methods to scheme against him like a swarm of bees? There's something off about this. Wei Shang, please go investigate where this information about the Marquis of Jin Ning being a cut sleeve came from. Before Yan Shaohan could finish speaking, a blue-clothed young eunuch suddenly came into the outer hall. This was the disciple of eunuch Tian, the eunuch who took notes during audiences with his majesty. The two of them quickly cut their conversation short and stepped forward to receive instructions. The young eunuch said, His majesty summons Lord Yan to present himself at Yangshin Hall. Hearing that he had business, Wei Shuzhou was about to step aside conscientiously, but Yan Shaohan motioned to him behind his back and said, Wait a moment, eunuch. I have some official business to discuss with General Wei. The young eunuch said unfeelingly, These are His Majesty's verbal instructions. Lord Yan, are you really going to make His Majesty wait for you? A trace of a fleeting smile appeared at the corners of Yan Shaohan's lips. His most common expression, which was gentle, but also made him look as though he were about to eat someone. I am the Imperial Investigator of the Thalong Guard. Each and every one of my actions serves the Emperor. What you've said puts me in a difficult spot, eunuch. The eunuch had only been blustering. When Yan Shaohan smiled at him like this, he instantly recalled the frightening legends in the palace concerning this Imperial Investigator of the Thalong Guard. His expression changed dramatically. He barely managed to keep calm. Giving way, he said, that, that being the case, do as you wish, Lord Yan. The bewildered General Wei was pulled in front of the writing desk. Yan Shahan casually picked up some, some files for verismilitude. Lowering his voice, he said, Go to the Marquis of Jin Ning Manor for me. Tell him the news from outside. Tell Fu Shen that he must be careful and make his preparations soon. No matter what happens, he has to hold steady. He must not act blindly without thinking. This raised a flame in Wei Shuzhou's gossip-loving heart. But seeing that Yan Shaohan's expression was solemn and he didn't seem to be joking, he quickly nodded and said, Set your mind at ease, your honor. Just leave it to me. And realize now he's lied. He's not trying to serve the emperor here. He's trying to help Fu Shen here. Because he's actually, you know... However confidently he spoke, Yan Shaohan ultimately couldn't keep the eunuch delivering the decree waiting too long. He had to temporarily put this mess aside and hasten to Yanshin Hall. The note-taking eunuch Tian Tong had never gotten along with the Feilong Guard, and the young eunuch shared in his teacher's enmity. He was unwilling to reveal anything. Only when Yan Shaohan entered Yangshin Hall did he find that in addition to Emperor Yuantai, the crown prince, Sun Yan Liang, was also in the hall. Remember, that's the guy from the last chapter that was sleeping with the consort who was the daughter of the mom who was scheming. So we've come back to that. This humble servant pays respects to his majesty, pays respects to his majesty, the crown prince. Arise. Emperor Yuantai was tall, his features dignified. His face had a slightly plump, slack appearance. There were two deep folds beside his nose. His lips were slightly thin. He was a stern, domineering, fickle appearance. This emperor was worthy of being called able and efficient. He had always been of serious disposition, quite solemn, but presently he seemed to be in a good mood. There was even a smile on his face, wiping away the anger and gloom previously brought on by the case of the diplomatic mission, making him actually seem far more kindly. It seemed that this wasn't a bad thing. Yan Shaohan felt slightly relieved, thinking to himself that he really was in a fright after the tricks and tactics coming one after another in recent days. He was a little jumpy. The crown prince wore a long face and stood by unmoved. Yan Shaohan could feel his gaze on him. It wasn't malicious, but contained a fine needle-like probing. The crown prince may return to the eastern palace. Emperor Yuantai wished to speak to Yan Shaohan alone. He considered, then for once gave the crown prince a word of encouragement. In today's matter, you have done well. Reco receiving this praise, the crown prince had already attained his primary goal for the day. He had no further hesitation about giving up his position. He averted his gaze from Yan Shaohan, even smiled at him. He bowed and withdrew. That smile seemed to contain indescribable mockery and pity. Yan Shaohan suddenly had an ominous premonition.
Premonition. Why am I... I'm struggling more on the English words. <laughs> Hello, Marcos. I'm well. How are you? All right. I think we can do one more chapter. Yeah, we can do one more chapter. Well, Lord Jan, doomed to worry and hard work, was suffering his fill of torment at the palace. The same Marquis of Jinning that he was concerned about was surrounded by chaos. Fu Shen's traveling party had only settled down a few days ago. His full-blooded little sister, Prince Qi Fu Ling, had sent a servant to pay her respects and deliver some items, as well as to convey that she would be coming in person to visit him another day. Fu Shen truly had no strength to deal with her and scrupled on account of the Marquis Manor not actually being the home of their parents. Worried that Prince Qi would be touchy, he refused on the spot. No need for that, just tell her to look after herself. The person who had come from the Prince Qi Manor was a servant who had come with Fu Ling from the Duke of Ying Manor when she was married. He knew their uncompromising eldest young master's temperament very well. He didn't dare to say half a word in protest, only went back to convey his response directly to Fu Ling. Basically, his sister was worried about her and about him and was going to come visit, and he was like, chill out, I'm fine, I'm going to go rest. When the response was delivered, Prince Qi's son Yun Duan happened to be present as well. Hearing this, he couldn't resist shaking his head. While Marquis Fu means well, he is being somewhat unreasonable. Since learning Fu Shen had been injured, Fu Ling had been so worried she hadn't slept for many nights, and she'd furtive, furtively cried in private several times. Now hearing that familiar and sensitive diction, for some reason she actually inexplicably calmed down. She clenched her teeth and held back her tears, saying, what an embarrassment in front of your highness. My older brother is stubborn as a mule. He has always been like this. Sun Yuandan and the princess had been married since they were teenagers. They were on excellent terms. He couldn't resist cracking a joke. Now you dare criticize him behind his back. Fu Ling blushed. Your highness is making fun of me again. Dage is cold on the outside, but warm on the inside. That is a term for older brother. I think it should be da Dage. I think I need to say it like that. Will I be keeping this on the channel? I will be moving it. I actually forgot to move the first one, so I'll move the first one tonight, and then a couple hours later, this has to process, and then I will move it to the second channel as well. He just never has any mercy when he speaks. I don't know what kind of sister-in-law would suit him in the future. Prince Chi remembered the rumors his subordinates had reported and deliberately changed the subject. Who can predict how a marriage will work out? Marquis Fu has just returned to the capital. The Marquis Manor must be extremely busy from top to bottom. It would be unsuitable for you to go now. He took Fu Ling's hand and shook it gently. Wait another couple of days until he settled in, then go pay him a visit. How about that? Fu Ling's eyes lit up. Your Highness will permit me to leave the manor? Now remember, noble women really don't leave their houses much, like at all. They, they live in very much close confinement. Prince Chi turned his head and kissed her cheek. With a quiet laugh, he said, He's your big brother, not an outsider. There's no harm in it. Only you must promise me to look after your health and your condition. You must not be rash. A faint flush instantly came over Fu Ling's face, making her countenance look even more brilliant. So bright and beautiful, she shone. She snuggled into Prince Chi's arms and quietly said, I understand. The weather was gloomy today, the wind colder than before. It seemed as if it was about to rain. Fu Shen feared this type of weather most. His old wounds ached incessantly, vexing him. He was about to call someone to push him to the study so he could find some leisure reading to distract himself when a servant came to report that Princess Chi had come in person to pay a visit. Her carriage was already at the gate. Fu Shen's head began to hurt. <sighs> that nuisance. Help me up. Uncle Fu, tell Xiao Shun and the bodyguards to keep away, and keep the people in the rear courtyard under control so there isn't a clash. Ask the princess to come into the main hall, get two boys to wait on her. I'll go over as soon as I've changed. In the main hall, Fu Ling was in no mood to examine this unfamiliar domicile. She was so nervous she kept wringing her handkerchief. Shortly, the rumble of a wooden wheelchair rolling over the ground came from further in. As if she had been scalded, she forgot herself and leapt out of her chair. She turned her head just in time to meet the eyes of Fu Shen sitting in the wheelchair. Fu Shen had perhaps not readied himself either. He was visibly startled. Remember, he's been off at war for like years, so this is, this is a long time since they've met. And he keeps her at a distance, I think, mostly to keep her safe from politics. 
Fu Shen had perhaps not readied himself either. He was visibly startled. Fu Ling stared at him blankly, as if she had suddenly forgotten how to speak. The older brother and her memories, who could hold up heaven and earth and conquer all obstacles, seemed to have been broken, huddled pathetically in a crude bamboo wheelchair, his features unusually sharp due to excessive emaciation. Yeah, because he, he's uh, also recovering from battle wounds, not just, you know, this isn't just a disabled, like, he's not just a disabled person who has grown up with a wheelchair. His legs were crushed under a rock, so he's recovering from a terrible injury. Fu Ling couldn't hold back anymore. Agitated, she threw herself toward him, gave a wail, and burst into tears. The old maid who had accompanied her was nearly scared out of her mind. Fu Shen was pushed back by the force, but utterly steady, he pulled her into his arms. Oh my goodness, go easy. Little lady, do you still think you're seven years old? Her taut heartstrings at last gave out altogether. Princess Chi forgot decorum and restraint, clutched his sleeve tightly, and sobbed so hard she could hardly speak. Babbling, she could only keep repeating, I only have one big brother. Fu Shen's breath caught. The knot of ice at the bottom of his heart was melted by her scalding tears, turning into a pool of warm water. Over the years, the two of them had been separated, one far away at the northern frontier, the other living in the depths of the prince's manor. Even the memory of their last meeting was vague, but this affection between blood relatives had never faded. He gently patted Fu Ling's back, the awkwardness of caution in his movements, and quietly comforted her. Don't cry, don't cry. It's all right. Guga is here. Don't be sad. That's another term for brother. Hello, folks joining us. Supposing General Fu really was a star of command come to Earth, then Princess Chi must have been a god of rain reincarnated. The Marquess of Jinning Manor was nearly swept away by tears. Fu Shen managed with difficulty to console his little sister. Physically and emotionally exhausted, he pressed on his temples and said helplessly, I told you not to come. You didn't listen and just had to come here to cry. Aren't you worried it'll injure your health? After your visit, we won't have to water the manor's garden for three years. Fu Ling was using hot water to clean her face and fix her makeup. Hearing this, she snorted a laugh and grumbled. You think I wanted this? Making me sit at home fretting is what would injure my health. Fu Shen choked on these words and resentfully lowered his hands. When Fu Ling was cleaned up, she sat back down next to Fu Shen and looked at his legs, which had a thin blanket lying over them. A worried look appeared on her face involuntarily. Daga, the wo wounds to your legs, can they really not be healed? There are so many famous physicians in the capital. Why don't I ask his majesty to help? His majesty has already sent a doctor to diagnose and treat me, Fu Shen said concisely. So, for those who weren't here for the first time or don't know, uh, there was a small scene in the first chapter where it's revealed Fu Shen is politically savvy. He's up to something a little. He's overplaying how badly he's been injured. So he might actually be able to recover, but he's telling everyone he can't. Fu Ling immediately held her tongue, despair flashing over her face. Shortly, she forced out a happy look once more. As if in self-consolation, she said, It's all right. Even if they can't be healed, it doesn't matter as long as you're alive. Stay in the capital. Don't go anywhere, all right? Her ardent gaze was like a knife stabbing straight at the bottom of Fu Shen's heart. He didn't want to lie to Fu Ling, but he also couldn't bear to make her sad, so all he could do was give a vague, hmm. Fu Ling finally let herself be coaxed into happiness, a trace of a genuine smile appearing. She chatted at length with him for a while, then suddenly remembered something and asked, Oh, right. Has our family sent anyone to come see you since you've been back? Had she not mentioned it, Fu Shen wouldn't even have remembered that family, so he gave a grim laugh in place of an answer. Fu Ling said helplessly, I used to think that even if she didn't like us, she was after all the family matriarch. At any rate, we would have to make nice on the surface. I didn't think she would take cutting ties to this extreme. Since when do we have any ties with her? They were all severed in one clean cut when I moved out, and there's no need for you to accept a compromise just because she's your elder, Fu Shen said carelessly. All she cares about now is Fu Ya. Just you wait. See when that darling son of hers will lay her a golden egg. This time, not just Fu Ling, but even the servant who'd come from the Duke of Ying Manor laughed. We, ha we were having a nice chat. Why mention something so annoying? Fu Shen wasn't in the mood to get tied up with domestic trivialities. What about you? How are you getting along in the Prince's Manor? Everything is going well. 
and his highness is very good to me. Fu Ling turned slightly. Like a little girl, she took his sleeve and shook it. Quietly, she said, Actually, I was hoping uh, you could come back to the capital this year. What's the matter? Fu Shen was instantly on the alert. <laughs> Big brother. <laughs> What's happened? Has the family been bullying? Has the family been bullying you again? It wasn't his fault that he was oversensitive and let his thoughts go astray. All the big brothers in the world were more or less like this. Their concern was often embodied in being ready to back a person against their bullies. It's good news, a slight flush appeared on Fu Ling's face. Daga, you're going to be an uncle. Oh. Fu Shen had only understood the first sentence. His expression normal, he nodded. After a few breaths, he suddenly realized what the second sentence meant and was so startled he nearly stood up from the wheelchair on the spot. He raised his voice abruptly. What did you say? Fu Ling put a hand on her flat lower abdomen and in all smiles said, It's been over three months. Uh, how? The Marquis of Jin Ning had for once lost his composure. How old are you? Wait, how did this happen? <laughs> Fu Ling watched his discomfiture with a smile. Fu Shen smacked himself on the forehead and finally realized his question had been nonsensical. He laughed in spite of himself. That's really good. Wonderful. In fact, Fu Shen didn't amount to an up-to-standard older brother. Their mother had died young, their stepmother was not affectionate, and he had naturally gone onto the battlefield early, finding it hard even to come home every year, never mind looking after his little sister. The two of them were only linked to ties of blood. Until right now, he had even thought he had nothing worth saying to his sister. And Fu Ling was outwardly soft, but inwardly firm. Even under Madame Chin's hand, she had smoothly matured into a fine young lady. The only time she had made a request of Fu Shen, it was because the crown prince had sent word he intended to take her for his first wife, and she didn't want to marry him. Only then had Fu Shen had an abrupt sense of being an older brother. He had wiped away Fu Ling's tears and told her, If you don't like him, then don't marry him. Don't be scared. I'll take care of everything for you. It was an older brother's mentality doing the mischief. When he looked at Fu Ling, he always thought she was still a dainty, weepy little girl, never willing to say anything straight out, always insisting on tugging at an adult's sleeve first. He hadn't thought that in the blink of an eye, she would be married and a wife, and in a blink of another eye, about to be a mother. When he heard she was pregnant, after his excitement had passed, Fu Shen didn't dare keep her at the manor for long. This person, who didn't believe in gods or ghosts, had unexpectedly turned superstitious. He was afraid that he and his manor full of soldiers who had come fresh from the battlefield had too much vitality, which would be bad for the child. He simply chased Fu Ling out. Only when she had reached the gate and been helped into the carriage by her maid did Fu Shen say earnestly through the window, Take good care of yourself. I'm staying in the capital for now. I'm not going anywhere. You get through your pregnancy without worrying. Don't put yourself to any trouble. Fu Ling was about to cry again. Holding back sobs, she said, Just look at what my Guga says. Who would dare to put me to any trouble? Right. Fu Shen agreed warmly. Guga will take care of everything for you. Go on. The Marquis Manor's front gate shut once more. Uncle Fu returned inside, pushing Fu Shen. Mean midway there, Fu Shen suddenly said, Remember to go to the storehouse and collect some nourishing medicinal ingredients. Take some bolts of silk and furs of various colors and send them to Prince Chi Manor another day. Uncle Fu said, Is this a gift for the young lady? Should I add something for his highness? Not counting today, Prince Chi Manor has sent quite a lot of gifts lately. Fu Shen nodded. I remember there's a gold star dragon tail sh in inkstone in the study. Go get that later and think of a few other things to add. Back to the politics. At the last moment, he hit upon the notion of going to the study, but the study had long been sealed off and disused. The old servant was worried there would be an accumulation of dust inside and ordered it swept before daring to let Fu Shen enter. He hadn't thought that trouble would come of this sweeping. While Fu Shen was looking for the inkstone, he discovered an unfamiliar long wooden box on the desk. This didn't belong to him, but someone had displayed it on the table front and center, as if deliberately putting it there for him to see. The wooden box was very light. There was a noise when he shook it as if it contained a thin stick. Fu Shen was very wary. He turned it over and over, inspecting it several times. When he determined that there was no booby trap, he at last carefully lifted the lid. His hand suddenly went rigid in midair. His eyes froze altogether. A damaged black crossbow bolt. 
lay quietly in the box, its shaft nearly snapped in two, its tip twisted as if it had struck something hard. This thing was familiar enough to strike fear into the heart. No one in the world could have had a deeper impression of it than Fu Shen. On the ninth day of the ninth month, in Tongzhou's Qingxia Pat Gap, in an instant of life and death peril as the stones fell, this was the cold boat that had come from behind and brushed past him. So jumping back to the uh, time when he got injured, when all those, they were passing in a canyon and rocks fell and he was injured. During that attack, an arrow almost killed him. So there was an assassination attempt amid all this chaos. And now someone has left the arrow on his desk for him to find. Clearly something, you know, somebody knows something, something's up. And of course we have all this politi political stuff in the background where rumors are spreading that he's gay. The emperor has something up his sleeve. The mother, the stepmother wants to get him out of the way. Like, there's a lot going on there in just, what, three chapters? We're now on chapter six. Uh, just chapter seven next time. We'll stop there. I think three seems to be a good balance of, of time. Um, I will upload the other one to the book channel, which is linked in the description. So that if you want to hear what the beginning was, and I highly recommend it, do, do go do that. We're going to do more games. I am going to get back to doing streams. I've got to figure out how to make the games work so we can do games. Um, but we're going to, I guess, focus on books for now, but since uh, I couldn't make that game work, I'll have to mess with it and see if I can make it work on here, and uh, maybe we'll play some. I figure alternate like we used to, book game, book game, alternate days. Um, and I need to finish an essay. We're on, I'm on 15 minutes of about a 45-minute edit, <laughs> so actually it's probably going to be longer than that. I don't know. Um, so hopefully essay video soon. And hopefully now that I'm start, I'm really starting to feel, I know I've said this many times, but it, like, it's been a passage of figuring out different problems. And I feel like we finally got it. We've cured the anemia and now we got rid of what was causing me thyroid problems. So hopefully I think we're getting back to normal. Knock on wood. <laughs> Thanks again for watching. Uh, I will get my streaming set up to look good again also and have an actual ending screen. I had to move it all to my other computer, and all the files are on the other computer, which I forgot to move, so good job me. And that was dumb. Anyway, I will move all the streaming stuff, and uh, go check out the book channel if you like this. Lots of other books, horror books, Japanese books, Chinese books, lots of stuff. I want to do more of that channel because, I don't know, it's just fun and relaxing for when I'm not doing big research or not in the mood for it. So, uh, yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.